Well, while everybody is coming up, let me just make a couple comments here while we're waiting to get set up. Um, the person you're seeing on the screen here is Skyped in. That's Timothy Kendall. And uh, Timothy, uh, I'm, you're I'm in North right Carolina, is that right? I am now, yes, thank you. Okay, so, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I want right to just make a couple comments and reflections here. Um, I was fortunate enough, at least this is how I look at it, to being just a couple, three years too young to have this experience. Uh, we have two veterans of the war up here, and then Patrick will tell his story. Um, a younger generation, but certainly was caught up in all of this just as much as everybody else. To me, growing up and being interested in history and politics and hearing all about this, and looking back 50 years, can you believe it's 50 years now? It is easily, in my understanding and recollection, the most traumatic experience of the last 60, 70 years in American history. Now, some who are going through what we're going through right now with a lot of uh, angst and division in the country might think it's today, but no, I don't even think it begins to touch the divisions and the anger and the confusion that Vietnam represented. And so it's important for us to take a look back, I think, and it's important for all of us to understand a little bit more about this. And Kimberly, thank you for finding the right excerpts to play in this to really key this discussion up. Uh, one little anecdote. I, have, I talked to my young intern the other day who's a graduate student at UIS, and I asked him how much he knew about the Vietnam War. Now, mind you, this is a, a history major who had taken courses on American history to include the standard survey courses, the first half of the country's history, the second half of the country's history. Any guess of where the second half of the country's history finished off? World War II. So when I asked him how much he knew about it, he knew very little. And I think after today's experiences, listening to my interview with, uh, with Connie here, and tonight, and then by the time he leaves here, he'll have a much better understanding of what the Vietnam War was about. But that's what we're here for. Very quick introduction here. On my far left is John Roschke, who I've known for many, many years. John served as an advisor to the South Vietnamese Army, uh, what they called MACV. So he had to learn Vietnamese first and then got to the country, I think, in 1969, John? Yes, yes. And worked in the Mekong Delta region as an advisor from his experiences as an engineer officer working with South Vietnamese and getting to know them in a very personal way. Uh, next to him is Connie Edwards, who grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and was experiencing a lot of the events of the Civil Rights Movement in the late 1950s and early 60s. Uh, she went to Tuskegee Institute, got her nursing degree there, and because of the arrangement, I mean, this helped pay a big family, so it helped pay for college. You knew the deal, but uh, went straight to the Army right after she got her nursing degree and graduated. And within a year or so after that, she found herself working in the 24th Evacuation Hospital north of Saigon, got there in the fall of 1967, and left a year later in 1968. So for many people, that's the height of the conflict, certainly when the numbers of, of American military peaked. And then we got Patrick Lamb, who was born in 1972, correct? Yes. And in 1979, his family decided there's really nothing for us in Vietnam. And they lived in Ho Chi Minh City at the time. Yes. And so his mother, his father had been killed in 1974, I believe. Uh, he had been a translator for the United States Army and he went home one time on a rare occasion on his own and was ambushed and died. So in 1979, his mother made the decision that of all her children, Patrick would be the one who would try to venture out with aunts and uncles and see if they could make their way to the United States, and obviously he did. And 
for a very different kind of a perspective. I think all four of them represent a different perspective. We have Timothy Kendall, who uh, was a student at the university, excuse me, Notre Dame University as a young man. And while there, I find it interesting, Timothy, a theology major of all things, um, started to think about the Vietnam War. And by the time he got to his senior year, uh, decided not to register, decided not to apply for conscientious objector status, graduated from Notre Dame, went home to Virginia and turned himself into the authorities and spent the next year and a half, roughly, in prison in Pennsylvania. So that's a very brief introduction. What I'd like to have each one of you do now, and uh, I'll, I'll start again with John and then Connie and then you, Timothy, and finish off with Patrick. In three or four minutes, give us a little bit broader vision of what you're doing in Vietnam. Well, let me start out by saying that uh, uh, as being a product of the baby boom, I was the uh, second boy of 10 children. We grew up on a poor farm uh, up in Geneseo, which is Henry County, for those of you that know your counties in Illinois. Uh, spent uh, my formative years working hard, going to church, playing with my brothers, watching TV. But inevitably, uh, as my generation faced, uh, the draft was out there. And knowing that I was going to be drafted, I enlisted in the Army with the intent of becoming an x-ray technician, or at least that's what my recruiter told me. <laughs> Started out uh, basic training for Campbell, Kentucky in February 1990, or 1967. Uh, went through that, then went down to Fort Sam Houston where I was somewhat rudely informed that I wasn't going to be an x-ray technician, I was going to become a medic. I didn't think a whole lot of that idea since uh, those guys were out on the front line getting shot at, having to pull people in that were getting shot at. So I thought, let's see if we can do something else. So having taken the, the necessary test, I was eligible for officer candidate school. And uh, after serving at Fort Sam Houston for about eight more months, during which time I was helping train conscientious objectors to become combat medics. Uh, I was taken into OCS at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and later commissioned an engineer officer. Was assigned to Fort uh, Hood down in Texas. And at that point in time, this was late 1968, Fort Hood consisted of those people that were just coming back from Vietnam or just going to Vietnam and consequently, the attitudes weren't terribly good. Uh, so I decided, well, let's do something different here. So I volunteered to go to Vietnam uh, with a stipulation that I wanted to become an advisor. I wanted to go to their uh, advisor school, and I also wanted to go to Vietnamese language school. Uh, the Army sent me to um, advisor school at Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, during which time we had about eight weeks of Cultural training, which meant that they were exposing us to Vietnamese custom traditions, uh, how you interact with the Vietnamese, uh, certainly uh, weapons training on the various weapons that we would be facing over there, and also the language training. Uh, finishing there, they sent me to Fort Bliss, uh, Texas, uh, underwent another six or eight weeks of uh, language school. So at the end of the time, I was reasonably proficient uh, in the Vietnamese language. Uh, arrived over in Vietnam in June, uh, July of 1969 and went to an advisory's team which was located in the heart of the Mekong Delta. There were absolutely no American units around us. We were strictly by ourselves and our job was to interact with the Vietnamese, to uh, advise them, to train them, uh, to facilitate uh, support for them and uh, did that uh, during my tour there. Uh, another quirk was that uh, having been somewhat proficient in Vietnamese, the, uh, the province senior advisor said, uh, you're 20 years old, you can speak Vietnamese, we need uh, young people like you to go out in the field and, and work with the Vietnamese during their combat operations. So I spent a lot of time doing that. I spent a lot of time living with the Vietnamese 
uh, and during which time I uh, became very, very close with them. And to this day, I just absolutely adore the Vietnamese people uh, for what they did for me, uh, what they've endured, and um, how those that were fortunate enough to come into this country, how they have prospered. I, I think that's just a real tribute to who they are. Uh, finished up in Vietnam, came back, uh, stationed at Fort uh, Leonard Wood for a while, decided that wasn't really good either. Got out of the Army and uh, went on my merry way. Like most other Vietnam veterans, um, probably many in this, this uh, audience tonight, uh, and like the young man uh, at the introduction of uh, the Ken Burns film, just chose not to talk about my experience in Vietnam. Um, it was something that you just did, that you hid, and you just moved on with your life. Um, I have no regrets of my service in Vietnam. Um, uh, again, it was just a, it, I, was, I just felt very fortunate, very blessed. Um, I should just add and then close that I did spend the next uh, about um, 25 years in the military, uh, retired in 1999. And, uh, uh, I, I, I think occasionally of my service in Vietnam, but I, I just don't dwell on it. It's just something that I accept, and I just moved on, and I think that my life has been or better for that. Connie, your turn. I'm Connie Edwards. Um, I was a student nurse. <laughs> um, didn't know the Vietnam War was really going on. I went to, to a rural college. So we had transistor radios and the newspaper came every now and then. So I didn't really know what was going on, but people came in from all of the services and they were recruiting nurses to go over. Uh, the class before me had 10 people in it who had gone over. And um, my dad sent me to college with $10 a month and that was to replenish the school supplies and sanitary supplies and things like that. So when they offered me $300 a month to be a PFC and I'd owe them three years when I get out, it sounded pretty good to me. So I went in and uh, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant six months before I graduated from college. And when I got on basic uh, training, found out that everybody wanted a Tuskegee nurse. And so that's how they were really there to get Tuskegee nurses. Um, I found that I was relatively okay prepared to go there because I had been one of the foot soldiers in the civil rights movement in Birmingham, better known to my classmates as Bombingham. Mm. So we'd heard quite a bit. And uh, not, Vietnam was not my choice. It was one of those things that you volunteer once and you get assigned all the rest of the time. And so I ended up there with a one week notice to get into the Army. I took a train because nobody told me that I was active duty while I was in college and that I was entitled to a flight to get to San Antonio. So it took me two days to get there on the train just to start off. Then when I got ready to go to Vietnam, I had what they call overseas replace, no, not overseas training. And of course, I got killed a few times in the simulations. Um, out, I thought I needed to put on makeup because San, uh, I was in El Paso, Texas, which they said was very closely resembled to Vietnam. And I found that to be true. Uh, a couple lizards would come to my front door and I'd be late for work because the lizard's at the apartment door and I can't get out. <laughs> and um, so when I got ready to go, I went to this overseas replacement. They, they had the aircraft coming over your head just like this and I'm walking up and that El Paso sand is now in my eyes and I decided I was gonna get the makeup and all that stuff and they says, Lieutenant, you are dead. And so, Okay, now I know what I'm supposed to be up to when I go there. They didn't really have helicopters on that training, but that's what I had to deal with most when I was in Vietnam because we had to go out and greet the 
casualties as they came in on the helicopters. And that's where I learned you're supposed to duck and you do whatever is necessary to keep your head on. I did have a couple patients that had had some things almost taken away from them with the blades on the helicopter. Um, to me, that was a good experience. I always say it was the most complete experience <coughs> that I had in nursing, but it's not one that I'd like to repeat. Um, I went back to Vietnam in 2012, uh, mostly for healing and to see what other people, what my patients had been through. They would tell us all about the rice paddies and the jungles and the bamboo. I pulled a few bamboos out of butts, but, and jungle rot and all those kinds of things that they had experienced. However, when I went back to Vietnam in 2012, it didn't look that bad to me. The rice paddies were pretty. Uh, the air fills that we had used were used to dry the rice on. Um, it's just, it was a different thing. I never saw, the, the only thing that I saw when I was in Vietnam was twice I got to go out on the economy. And after that, the war was so bad that I was pretty much confined to the hospital where my regular assignment was 12 hours a day, six days a week. And uh, because things were relatively noisy at night, um, didn't sleep a whole lot because I would go to the cafeteria, the cooks would be up all night, so when I get off at midnight, I just go and help them make pie crust. And a couple times got caught in the bunkers uh, you get to bed, and next thing you know, you got to get up and get, get to the bunkers. Um, we'd hear about a week beforehand that you're going to get hit, and I'm thinking, if you know already a week ahead, why did we end up getting hit <laughs> exactly the same time that they said it was going to happen? I still haven't figured that one out. Um, <laughs> Some of what happened to was my classmates all were going over. Um, I was seeing a lot of people coming in with the injuries. Um, I was 23 years old. Um, most of the patients were either younger than I or about my age. So of course I was thinking Mr. Hoosie is not going to be there when I get ready to get married because they're killing them all. But, um, Eventually, uh, 12 months later, I ended back home. Uh, I didn't realize that I was almost 24 hours so in time difference away from home. I called my parents the one time that I had to talk to them. I thought I was going to ask them how was their Christmas, and then I found out they were just going to bed for Christmas Eve. Uh, we'd finished. <laughs> um, but I'd say anything that grew, grew in Vietnam, any body part that, that we have, I got to see at least one of them without having to cut it open myself. It was already open when I got it. And uh, I'm not as hard as people thought. My grandmother died shortly after I came back and I got blessed out because I cried and people thought, well, you're a nurse, you've been to Vietnam, you're supposed to be used to death. And I just didn't think, it makes you over, but it doesn't make you over that much. And uh, Connie, I think we probably need to get to Timothy here so we can get all of these stories yeah. in. And okay. Timothy, um, you've got a fascinating story. So again, the challenge is to keep it uh, fairly brief for us. Sure, I'll try to make it as uh, concise as I can. Um, I'm speaking to you from North Carolina now. I actually live in Virginia. I happen to be in North Carolina at the moment. Um, I was born in 1949 um, into a family that ultimately had uh, 13 children, one at a time, um, and uh, as you might surmise, it was a Catholic family, and I was uh, raised as a Catholic, uh, not a um, member of a pacifist church uh, or a traditionally um, anti-war uh, church or anything like that. Um, went to Catholic schools all the way through the university, except I guess I spent three years in public school when I was in, in uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. 
Um, so when I uh, finished high school and was getting ready to uh, apply for college, I was just pretty much an average uh, uh, religious kid, um, you know, who had been raised fairly seriously uh, Catholic, and um, uh, all I knew about the war was what everyone else knew about the war from watching the evening news or reading uh, the newspapers or the mer many magazines. Um, the support for it was nearly universal. I certainly um, thought, thought of myself as supporting it all the way through high school and well into college. Um, I registered for the draft on my 18th birthday. Um, I, there was some legally required window of time, but I just went and you know, got it over with on my birthday itself. Um, went off to college on uh, a grand combination of scholarships and loans, as you can imagine, with uh, 13 kids. And when I tell you my father did not have a degree, and of course my mother uh, was never able to have an income of her own. She stayed home and raised kids for, for her, her um, career. Um, there was no money for, for college, and, and I never expected actually to be able to go, but um, as I discovered as time went on, um, the uh, government and various um, organizations had begun um, uh, supplying loan money and, and uh, scholarship money, so I actually was able to go to school. Uh, when I got to the University of Notre Dame, as, as you're probably aware of, fairly conservative university um, then and now, um, I you know, began to, for the first time in my life, um, encounter some people whom I respected, um, who were opposed to the war and, and, and uh, raised questions about that and, and other things around it. They drew um, parallels, well, not parallels, but connections between the uh, the war and the uh, civil rights struggle here at home. Um, I never was subjected to anything like pressure from anybody to change my mind about any of this, but I did have some professors who taught me that it would be a really good idea to learn as much as I could, formulate questions, see if I could find answers. Um, and over time, I uh, began really questioning what America was doing in, in the war, uh, why we were doing it. Um, I didn't come up with a lot of um, convincing answers. Uh, there were you know, some uh, certainly persuasive arguments in the other direction. Um, but over time, I, I became an opponent of the war. And um, then as I continued to read and think about all this, uh, an opponent of the way the draft system um, operated. And um, you know, of course, the war would have been impossible to, uh, to uh, sustain without the without the, the draft. So by the time I was um, to, I'm leaving out a lot of detail here, of course. But by the time I was finishing my junior year, I knew that um, uh, contrary to what I had thought about before, I was not going to be filing for conscientious objector status and writing um, a you know a statement. You had to write a virtual um, thesis to uh, support your claim if you weren't already a member of a recognized pacifist church or something like that. Um, and that uh, it was, you know, I, was, I, was, I saw myself as opposing the draft as well as the war. Um, so senior year, I did not renew my student deferment. Um, the way the student deferments worked was you had to file for one every year that you were in school. And if you were ever not in school and therefore couldn't file, then you were um, eligible to begin processing by the draft system. So I, I, didn't, I was still in school, but I didn't file for a, um, a deferment. Uh, they got around to noticing that about oh, uh, December or so of my senior year. And I began to get mail from the draft board. Uh, some of it I ignored. Some of it I sent back with youthfully snarky things written on the envelope. Um, and um, it, it's a long story, but I was, I, I was ultimately ordered for um, a physical, and I didn't appear for that. I was ordered for induction, and I didn't appear for that. And then I was indicted with three weeks to go in college, three weeks before graduation. Um, I knew I didn't want to um, uh, leave school if I didn't have to. And as it turned out, even though I was carrying more than a full load, I was able to just disappear for a while because I didn't have any classes. I had six courses. A full load was five. Uh, but they were all one-on-one -on -one with professors. And um, I would you know, come out at night and slip papers under their door and things like that. It was all very um, – um, it was, it was overdramatic and, and uh, juvenile. 
Uh, but I did get through school, and so I came out of um, virtual, well, you might as well call it hiding. It wasn't really serious. They could have found me if they wanted to. Um, but I came out of, of that on uh, graduation day. Um, I was already under indictment. It was They were felony charges. Um, after graduation, we drove all night back to Richmond, Virginia, where I was from. Um, and the next day, I went and turned myself in at the federal marshal's office. Um, Again, making the story as short as I can, a trial followed in June. I was uh, convicted on one count of a two-count indictment. The other count was uh, dismissed by the judge. Um, and in September of that year, which was 1971, um, I went to prison for what was originally going to be four years. Um, the uh, judge, um, half, partway through, um, like many other people in the country at that time, had a change of heart about the war. And it's, this is a long story, too. I'll, I'll just make it short. He cut my time in half. Uh, so I ended up um, doing what's, what's known in the system as maxing out on two years, which is uh, somewhat less than two years when you subtract what was known as good time. Um, so that was you know, my own personal experience. Uh, needless to say, the uh, experience has been with me for quite a long time. Um, I have moved away from the religion that I grew up in, um, but I have not moved away from the pacifist con uh, convictions that I developed uh, mostly in, in college. And as a matter of fact, I see myself as, as more of a pacifist now than I was when I was religious. Uh, that would have surprised me if anybody had told me then that that could ever happen. Um, but I see it now as more of a practical thing than a religious thing, and so uh, here I am. Thank you very much, Timothy. I should mention here, uh, everybody who's sitting on this panel has been interviewed, part of our oral history program. And by tomorrow, Connie, we'll get your interview up as well. But these interviews are available for the public, and you're, you can hear the unabridged version of all these stories. And Timothy has indicated here there's much more background. They all have much more background and we've had a chance to talk about here. So I encourage you to check out our webpage, www.oralhistory.illinois.gov. So that's my pitch. Patrick, your turn. Oh, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Mark Depoo for inviting me back for a second time on stage. It's still nerve wracking up here, uh, but it's definitely a humble experience um, to be among all of you. I am no hero. Uh, I like to think of myself as, a, I guess, result of the war. Um, I came to the United States in 1980. Um, my journey started back in Vietnam when, um, at the end of the war, luckily for me, I was too young to remember all the, the incident and all the dramas that came along with that, so I was very fortunate for that. But I remember growing up in, uh, under communism, there was no life. We had to go out and pick vegetables, fruits, fish. I remember uh, even when I was five years old, I went and uh, catch these little minnows to bring home. I had these cans and wrap around my waist, go catch the minnows with worms tied to the end of a string that I pulled out of a banana tree. So we survived, lived under, under communism. My mom, my dad passed away, so my mom raised four kids um, south of Saigon. Um, it was called Saigon back then, now it's Ho Chi Minh. But uh, there was no life during that time. We just lived and the government controlled everything that you had. Um, we then, my grandmother was fortunate enough to save enough money to buy our tickets on this boat. Um, my aunt, uncle told me that there were about 130 people. It was a small fishing boat. We all packed in like sardines. I just remember images of getting on the boat. This was in 1979, um, saying goodbye to my mom in tears. She told me that, uh, I'll see you, have a good trip. Just take care of yourself and listen to your aunt and uncle. Uh, I didn't know my aunt and uncle at that time because I lived up with my mom and who are these strange people that I call aunt and uncle. I went with my cousin also um, on the trip. Uh, we remember getting on the boat late at night. It was an escape more than a journey. Uh, you have to escape in the middle of the night. If you get caught leaving the country, they'll sink the ship and then you swim back in and then you go to prison for that. Uh, fortunately, we were. Um, we, I got out, we got out in one piece, and then we ran into an oil rig. We were lost at sea for, I think, two to three weeks, as far as I can remember, after being chased by Malaysian pirates. Um, ran into an oil rig, 
my family, um, my aunt and uncle, uh, not immediate family, and my cousins were able to uh, make a deal. We jumped off the boat. Our boat captain didn't want to sink the boat because if uh, apparently he had some jewelry, uh, jewelry or valuable things hidden in the boat, so he didn't want to sink it. The oil rig could not rescue us unless it's, you know, take us on board unless it's a rescue mission. So my aunt and uncle, my cousin jumped off the boat and then the crane went down, lifted us up, and we thought at that time, hey, we're in America, it's home free. Nope, that's not the case. Um, they put us on another boat that they rescue that was um, attacked by Mal Malaysian <laughs> pirates. And on this boat, I remember seeing only men were left, the women were killed, tortured, raped, the children were kidnapped, the men told the story, they had blisters under their feet, I remember the size of a water balloon, they're saying that they were put on top and the women were molested down below. Um, so when we got on that boat, um, they dragged us to this island, and then from there we stay on this island, that was my new home for the next nine months. Um, the island's called Kuku, K-U-K-U, if you Google it you can see that, I see people, my time, going back there and looking at that as well. Uh, but after nine months, we had, I can't remember which organization came by, they did paperwork, and my sponsor was in Texas. I, uh, my aunt and uncle were sponsored to, to America. We went from Cuckoo to another island, and then from that island for a month, we went to Singapore, and then from Singapore, we flew to Texas, Port Arthur, Texas, and from there, uh, my aunt and uncle stayed there for the summer. Um, I kind of missed the life on the island. I was free like a kid, run around, did my hunting in the islands, uh, fishing and all that, try to enjoy as a kid. But um, after Texas, my aunt and uncle decided to go to Chicago to, to get an education. And that's where life began for all of us um, when we set foot to America. I remember crying the whole summer in America because I missed their freedom on that island. We lived in this housing project, um, the broken windows. There were kids screaming at night. People were yelling, bottles were breaking. I'm like, I don't want this, I want to go home now. I want to go back to Vietnam. Um, and then it got better. My, we got an education. My aunt and uncle worked. Um, we all worked and for the American dream. And the rest of his, his history, uh, I can't express how lucky that we are to be in this country and for the Americans to open the door for all of us to come in. So my experience is no comparison to, to all of you, the sacrifices that you've made. Um, it's just a small story uh, at the end of the war. But thank you for having me on board. I think you downplay the, the experience that you had. The one comment that you made to me when we did our interview is why didn't the rest of your family go? And your comment that your mother apparently told you is she figured there was only a 50-50 chance that anybody would get out. And so she was putting your life on the line, hopefully that the rest of the family would be able to eventually get to the United States. Yes, correct. And that tells all of you how important freedom is. And we would sacrifice our life for the freedom and the freedom that all of you veterans provided for us. So that, that means the whole world to all of us in America. Thank you. We need to get to some questions to the audience. I definitely want to leave plenty of time, but I have one other question for each one of you. And again, please try to be as brief as you can, maybe about a minute or so. The question is, now that we're 50 years removed from the Vietnam War and these experiences that were so searing in your own lives at the time, where are you at in terms of your experience and whether or not we were doing the right thing to be there in the first place? And John, I'll start with you. It's, it's hard to say whether you know, we should have been there in the first place. I mean, that's well beyond me, but uh, the, th the experience that I have that I have the most regret for is, uh, as you heard in my little introduction, I, I lived with the Vietnamese. I was with them constantly. My regret is the many uh, young soldiers and families that I was associated with or lived with uh, that we left behind. And uh, that's something that uh, haunts me, not every day, but it's something that's certainly in the back of my mind. And I would say, too, that uh, we have an advisory team reunion every couple of years. Uh, that's the theme from all of us, is 
the regrets we have for leaving our friends behind. Timothy, I think I'll go to you next. Obviously, you're in a very different place on this. Yes. Um, and you had thought about it much more than I think the other three members of our panel had before you had that decision to make. Well, I don't know about that. I know we, we, everybody had to do their own thinking about what their own situation was and how they were going to respond to it. Um, I, like John, I, I can't really address the fact, or the, not the fact, but the, the question of whether we should have been there in the first place um, because um, it was, it's, it's almost like it was there when, when, I, when I became conscious of, of you know, history and, and political um, goings on and, and so on. I know that um, many people uh, came to uh, conclusions other than mine, you know, different from mine. Um, I, I guess the other part of your question is, is uh, what, what, to what extent I, I still uh, feel the way that I did then. And I, I would like to say that I, 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 I feel like a more, um, an older and wiser version of, of, the, uh, of the person that I was then. And, and uh, I still have a lot of the same conclusions and same convictions. I think they're, they're more um, firmly grounded now. Um, the um, history of the world since then um, has continued, I think, to bear out the notion that, um, well, as, as the man in the, uh, in the film said, you know, th his example was, um, he was talking, uh, his Michael Holmes was his name, uh, and he said, you know, if you, you treat these people badly, if, if they're not VC now, they'll become VC. And we've seen this in you know, many places in the world in, in many different manifestations and guises, uh, but it seems to come back to um, the proposition that um, that kind of conflict um, very rarely produces um, what you think it's going to or want it to. And um, I think uh, we are in the uh, desperate situation, especially with what's going on in Korea now, uh, between the Korea and the United States, uh, we, we are desperately in need of another way. Okay. Connie. Well, I can't say much about whether we should have been there or not. Uh, the position that I took at the time was that people were going to be injured and or sick from whatever was going on there. Um, I had been educated to take care of the injured and the ill. And so that was my commitment um, to do what I needed to do at that point in time, was just to take care of them because the people who went, um, they had no more of an idea as to why they were there than I did. So I just decided that whatever was gonna happen to them, I was there just to help them. And I still maintain that position. Um, I just wish people could learn from the experiences, especially from Vietnam. And as we see people coming up all over the country uh, from other countries being our enemies right in the country, I do think that there is more necessity of us teaching people about war and about getting along with each other. Um, that's it. Okay. And Patrick, your, again, your experiences are very unique from the rest of the group, but I've found talking to Vietnam veterans that the experiences are all over the map and the opinions and the emotions are all over the map. So what's your take on it? Um, you know, my opinion of war is nobody wins in war. Everybody loses. Um, Americans sacrifice their life for our freedom. There are Vietnamese people that die for that as well. Um, we're people that I know are very grateful for what America has provided our family and for, uh, for the people that came to America. Um, I try to teach the generation that I know, the younger generation, that you're in America. This is heaven compared to any other places. Um, even though politicians are all over the microscope, everybody looks into politicians, it's more corrupted, uh, a lot more corruption in other countries. So no matter how you look at it, U.S. is still the best country um, that I know from experience. And I teach my kids, you know, even though Vietnam 
was daddy's home, but America is your home now. And hopefully one day, I'll be able to take my kids back, uh, my family, my wife, um, go back and, and experience what life was like for us back then. But uh, ultimately, um, this is the land that uh, we're gonna start our future in. And we're grateful, and just words cannot speak of the sacrifice that you and your family made. Uh, I'm sure you lost a lot of loved ones during the war. So there's no resentment from our view, the people that I know, I, especially the one that made it to America, because without America opening its door for us, we would not have a new life, and this is our new life, and we always try to make the most of it. Okay, I want to thank our four panel members. Now it's time for you, and the way this is gonna work, I mean, we had quite a conversation trying to figure out how best to manage this. Imagine the audience is divided into four quadrants. Uh, I'm gonna start with the what's in front of me here to the left and before that center aisle there. That's quadrant one and then we got quadrant two in the back and then we're going around the clock so there's three and four and there are people with microphones in each area and you raise your hand and I'll point you out. I would then ask that you wait for the microphone to get to you before you start talking and it would even be better if you stand up for two reasons. One, so the rest of the audience can hear your questions, and two, so we can get this recorded and Timothy can hear what you have to say as well. So, okay, so let's see if we have any questions up here in front to begin with. Well, right first, on the aisle. Okay, thank you. First of all, I'm surprised that Timothy didn't say that he was against the Vietnam War. Or they thought it was wrong for us to go to the, to, uh, to be engaged in the Vietnam War. But my question, and Mimi wanted to respond to that, to uh, Patrick Lamb uh, is whether his parents ever came over to the United States and to John Rasky, whether he ever reconnected with any of his friends in Vietnam after he came back to the U.S. Okay, I think there is a question for both Patrick and John. Did you want Timothy to make any comments as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, there's three questions in one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to let Patrick start. <clears throat> um, yes, uh, after I became U.S. citizen, uh, my aunt and uncle helped me sponsor my mom and my siblings um, to come to the United States. John. Yeah, your question was, have I ever reconnected with those that I served with in Vietnam? Is that correct? The Vietnamese, no. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to find them. There are a couple uh, that I do know of that are associated with our advisory team uh, that served with us during the time that I get to see every couple of years, but uh, in general, no. And, and Timothy, in, in your case, I'd like to preface the comments you'll make here with this, that when you and I talked over the phone here recently, what struck me was your comment about not judging anybody else's decisions about whether or not they were right in going there in the first place. Yes, well, I certainly don't judge any individual's uh, decisions. And I, I learned a long time ago that you know, people are, are as honest as I am and um, might very well uh, come to different conclusions. Um, overall, my answer to the question of whether we should have been there in the first place would have to come down as a no. But I um, hasten to add that the, uh, from at least my reading, the process by which we got there was so complex and labyrinthine and spaghetti-like or snake-like, take your pick, that it's very difficult to sort it out. When you say we shouldn't have done that in the first place, it sort of implies that somebody was to blame and you know, undoubtedly some you know, people were to blame, but just try sorting that out. It's bigger than I am. Um, I, you know, you, I recommend Neil Sheehan's book for people who might not might not be familiar with that. Um, a bright shining lie, I think, is the is the title. It's a, it's got some age on it now. It's quite old, but he he goes into a little bit of how it came about um, in quite compelling terms. Um, it's just as I say, the, the subject is bigger than I am. My own feeling is it should not have happened, but um, but it did, and a lot of people who. Um, participated in it and even participated in the decisions that, that led up to it, did so um, with the best in intentions that they could muster. Okay. How about a question in the back area here on my left? Hi. 
Hi, this is for Timothy. Um, I was a very new and very young faculty member at Western Illinois University in 1967, and I was teaching freshman comp, which all the students had to take. And we had to turn in our grades every quarter, at the end of every quarter. Now, when you're a new freshman and you're taking a writing class, it's pretty hard for most, most students. And a quarter isn't a very long time to get your yes, grades sir. up. We had to turn in our grades, and the university had to turn them over to the military. And that was so the military could tell whether or not the students could keep their, their college deferment for the draft. So what would happen is students would come to us, faculty members, and they'd say, look, you know, I know I got a D average, but if I don't get a C in this class, I'm going to get drafted. And that was a terrible situation for new faculty, for all faculty to be in, because we knew that was true. And I, to this day, think that was the beginning of great inflation at the universities. Um, <laughs> but, it, it very likely had something to do with it, yes. Yeah, that's that's but, not a joke. It's, it's yeah, serious. I know. And of course, then the students took over the English department building because why English, you would say, but well, because ROTC was in the English department building at Western Illinois University. Mm -hmm. But um, I wondered if you, did you interact with your professors at Notre Dame in any kind of way? Did they talk about the war? We certainly talked about the war in our comp classes. Students wrote about the war. Uh, vets coming back wrote about the war and some of their experiences. I wondered if, you know, what your interaction was like with, your, with the faculty there. Yes, um, well, I didn't have interaction with them as a matter of class. Uh, that is class work in class. In fact, I had one um, English composition teacher when I was a freshman who expressly forbade the Vietnam War as a topic for writing persuasive papers. He just said, I'm sorry, I think everybody is wrong and it's, it's just, it's too big a topic for the five pages I want you to turn in, so don't, you know, do it on something else. Um, that wasn't a big issue to me at the time. Um, the one professor that kind of set me on the the road to where I ultimately ended up was a logic professor. And this was you know, mathematical symbolic logic. It wasn't a, um, a, a class where you would do actually you know, philosophical arguments. It was uh, much like abstract mathematics, which I was terrible at, by the way. Um, but he, I know, had, had been uh, an opponent of the war and had been um, working for, um, I guess, I don't know about Kennedy. He certainly worked for McCarthy in the primary periods, uh, Eugene McCarthy. And um, I can remember him saying um, that, and, and he, the one thing he did say in class was the day after Lyndon Johnson announced that he would not run for another term, um, uh, he said um, that a, a, you, you had to conclude that a country where the, um, the uh, voices of the citizens could um, bring about something like a president leaving office um, was a country worth holding on to and worth working for and worth doing everything you could to to maintain and so there you know here was this guy who was was a, a war opponent I was a freshman um, as I say my, my own thinking was was still pretty fledgling and uh, you know I, I asked him you know could we talk about this sometime so he had me over and we drank some cokes and and we talked about it for an afternoon and he again there was no pressure he I knew where you know what his position was but what he was trying to get me to do was formulate questions and, and uh, look for answers and not just, you know, take it out of Time magazine or, or something like that. So, yeah, there, there was interaction with the faculty. I did not personally, and I don't know, I didn't know of any cases of the kind of grade inflation stuff that you're talking about. I know uh, just from reading at the time that it must have been going on in some places, but I never saw it. Okay. It's the back quadrant right here. We have a question from that area. And I appreciate you cooperating with us here on the asking your questions. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you. You started the discussion here, and this is not a question for any particular member, but in general. You started the discussion with the question of should we have been there in the first place? But it seems to me that's not the better question. The better question is, should we have stayed there as long as we did? Because by 1965, 1966, didn't Lyndon Johnson and Albert McNamara know that this could not end well? Didn't they know that we cannot achieve the goals that we stated were our goals? But nonetheless, because of hubris, 
continued to keep us there? Didn't Richard Nixon know that by 1969? And because of hubris, continue to keep us there? So if anyone there has any insight on that, I'd like to know, isn't that the better question? What's the answer? Because I think that will inform our decisions of today better than the question of should we have been there in the first place. Well, as the moderator, I'm going to take some license here and start off, and then I'll turn it over to the rest of our panel. Um, here's what I understand about war, having studied it quite a bit, but never having been in one. That once you make an initial decision to start, to make, you know, to send troops overseas, from that point on, the war takes on a life of its own. And you really don't know which direction it's going to be. It's going to go. And there comes a point in time when you get to the rationale where we've made so many sacrifices now, it would be terrible to pull out and stop and, and admit we were wrong. Um, but I think I'll let our other panel members pick it up from there. I'll jump on that if I can. Um, I think that perhaps the better question uh, should have been, should we have committed once we started for right or for wrong, should we have committed to winning the war? And I think that that was never done. John, you want to, that's a, that's a provocative comment. You, you, I think you need to elaborate a little well, bit. Well, I, I think when you try to run the war from the bowels of the Pentagon or from uh, the, the Oval Office, I think that you're losing everything. Uh, I think that uh, we've seen, um, certainly within Desert Shield, Desert Storm back in 91, uh, we saw what I thought was a textbook example of how the military, once they're used, uh, should be allowed to be used, which means the generals on the ground understanding the, the end state um, get us to that end state. And it's not like the, the politicians don't care about what they do, but it's that the politicians are not picking bombing targets and bombing routes and uh, in the end, uh, shutting off <coughs> flow of uh, munitions and supplies to the South Vietnamese armies. Amen. Okay, anybody else want to address the question? Let's get a question then from the front area right here. And right on the, yeah, right on the front here. Uh, good evening. Uh, for Michael, anybody who's here who read the sheet of paper that was passed out believes that you spent 19 years in prison. So <laughs> we were, it's good to hear it was only 19 months. Um, my question is to the two of you who were in country, not as a native, but with the military, and how much consciousness there was of the anti-war movement back here in the United States. Uh, if we talk about a nation that was sort of you know, ripe with all of this conflict over whether we should be there or not, uh, what about the, the, uh, the awareness of the anti-war movement by those of you who are serving there and uh, whatever you can recall about what was thought about those of us who stood up against this war. Connie, if- I would have to say that I did not know what was going on back home. I did have a sister to tell me that she saw that the hospital where I was was bombed, and I thought it did not happen. Uh, but we were not aware of what was going on, at least I was not. Uh, most of the patients that I had said that they were told that they could only shoot when they see the white of their eyes. And I learned about 10 years later that Congress had more to say about what was going on with the war than the soldier who was actually fighting it. Connie, I wonder if you can uh, uh, make a couple comments that you and I had a conversation today about what you encountered when you got to Chicago, and that was a couple years after you'd gotten back from Vietnam. That was about 1970. Part of what I had was I was being accused of keeping the war going. 
And I thought, how could that be? Um, the one thing is that I went over as an individual, there were six women on this plane with those other 200 and some men, and we were going to take care of the patients. That's what we knew. But I was called the baby killer, and I was said that if I didn't go there, the war wouldn't have gone on, and I was thinking I felt awfully helpless. I didn't have anything to do with the war continuing, but if that's, that was the impression that people had. I was also told many times that I was never in Vietnam. There were no such thing as American women in Vietnam. <laughs> and I had proof that I was somewhere 24 hours away from here <laughs> for 12 months. <laughs> but that was, that was what we heard. And uh, I had to take off, I, had, I was in the reserves and I, would have to stop off at the service station to take off my uniform and put it on to avoid being harassed if I had to stop at the grocery store or the gas station. So when I, I met, remember many days of just sitting in the, in the car at the gas station to wait until there was nobody out there who would harass me when I got out. And I thought, I am the last person who needs to be harassed for the war continuing. But, I mean, we were there, and when you're there, you just feel like, well, somebody just shot at me. I got a shot, shoot back. And as Mark said, it takes on a life of its own. And that life, the breath of that war was breathed at home, not in the war zone. Okay, we've got some really great questions. Let me, let me respond to the question as well, but first of all, make the statement that I'm Glad after almost 50 years to learn that Connie alone is responsible for the prolonging of the war. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. <laughs> but, but in response to your uh, question or concern about were we uh, aware of what was going on in the United States with regard to protests and that, well, those of us that got there a bit later, uh, I got in country in 69. Uh, we've been exposed to that sort of thing, uh, certainly in 68 with the riots in D.C. That wasn't anti-war, but just the notion of the, of the country uh, of rioting. Um, so we had, we had known about that, but what I would say is that they did have an impact on morale uh, to the extent that you had to ask yourself, what am I really doing here? Am I doing good or, um, or am I as they say over in uh, the United States, am I just you know, making things worse and um, doing all these bad things? And then I would finally say too that uh, there is not a Vietnam veteran in this audience and perhaps in the country that doesn't remember Jane Fonda. And I will just let it go with that. <laughs> Timothy, I'd like to have you address that one as well. You had such a different perspective on things, but yes, um, whether or um, not you were involved question, in any protests, uh, and then how the how the your fellow prisoners treated you once you got to prison. Um, well, there were actually a lot of draft cases where I was. Are we are we communicating? Okay, can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Allenwood in those days, this is no longer true, I, I was at Allenwood prison, in those days it was a minimum security prison that was the, the, the lowest level of the, of the levels of, of, of federal prisons. Um, probably at least half the camp was, was draft cases and of those, the vast majority were Jehovah's Witnesses who were, you know, a, a member of a church that, that strictly forbade this kind of thing. Uh, but somehow, I don't know why, they didn't get the same deal that the Mennonites did. The Mennonites got left alone and the JWs went to, to, went to prison in droves. But what I would say about the, the anti-war movement in general is that it was not exactly homogeneous. Um, there were, you know, fools who would, would uh, go out and harass the troops, as, as Connie's talking about, you know, when, when they came home, or, or you know, heap all kinds of abuse on them as though, as though the war were their doing, were, were, were their fault. Um, I am, you know, just personally happy to say I did not know any of those people, um, and I knew a fair number of war opponents, um, but I know they existed because you couldn't miss it. I mean, it was it was in all the newspapers and all the uh, the news coverage, and uh, so the, the the point is that there were many levels of of opposition to the war. You had religious oppositions. Uh, you had uh, what I like to think of as, as uh, principled and you know um, logically uh, arrived at opposition. 
Um, and then you had people who didn't look to me like they'd ever had a serious thought in their lives. It was all a big party that, to them. And, and no, really, I, I, I've long since reached the if, if I hear all we are saying is give peace a chance one more time, I will flip. Um, and there was just a lot of that going on. People were not thinking it through. And, and a lot of a fair number of those would do just what you heard from Connie. And, and um, I thought it was disgraceful then. I think it's disgraceful now. Um, and, you know, likewise for the people coming back these days from all the places we're sending them in, in um, what some people are pleased to call the Middle East. Of course, it's really Asia, but we know, you know, what we're talking about. Um, as far as, um, you know, the freedom to, to prosecute a war and, and commit to win, um, one of the first things I would, you know, argue has to be present in, in that kind of thing is some definition of what winning means. You know, these days I, I don't see one, frankly. Um, in Vietnam, it was actually even a little better defined um, than it was now. I don't think it was possible that, you know, we were going to have a World War II-like conclusion. But at least people were thinking in those terms. These days, it's not clear that they're thinking at all in, in terms of, uh, I mean, you know, the leadership in, in terms of uh, what it is they're asking the troops to do. Okay. And I just think that's a terrible formula. We're at the point in time where we've had a great discussion. I think you can agree with me. You've got an incredible panel, but I believe we need to take just a couple more questions, and I will open it up to anybody in the audience and, and trust that uh, we can get you a microphone pretty quick. Right back here. Yes, sir. Uh, this is for Connie, but anybody else who wants to comment, feel free. Uh, today, one of the issues we're still dealing with, uh, as we're two, over 200 years old, um, is the issue of, of race and our history of slavery. And I was wondering, uh, since you were very active in the civil rights movement in Birmingham and one of the people at the forefront, I guess, of some of the activities, uh, how did that play out in Vietnam? Were you all just wearing green and that was the only thing that counted? Or did some of that come over and, and, and spill over to your everyday activities over there? It spilled over into the activity that I was there. Um, one of the horrible things was Martin Luther King was killed in April of the year that I was there. And uh, one of the people that I'd gone to basic with um, said all they need to do now is kill Rap Brown and Stokey Carmichael. And uh, we were already having fights there because they had the Confederate flag was flown over, was on the deuce and a quarters trucks. Some of the cafeterias had the Confederate flag on it and it was not there because that was their state flag it was there to be an insult to the rest of us. Um, I kind of let my own feelings come out, and so the guy who wanted to hit Stokey Carmichael and Rap Brown got hit on the head with uh, my breakfast tray. <laughs> <laughs> But I just knew that I was going to go to the LBJ, and I was going to be the first lady in there. But most of the people in the cafeteria did come to my defense, and the person who had said it gave me a hug and apologized in front of everybody in the cafeteria for having done what he did. Uh, it was a very emotional moment for me at that time because when I still had pigtails going this way, I had walked down in the church basement of the 16th Street Baptist Church with Martin Luther King. And so for that to happen while I was in Vietnam and to hear comments like that, and uh, I was not to wear a button of any sort about Martin Luther King or anything, but they could wear the Confederate flag anywhere they wanted to. So that was hard. I was an officer and I had enlisted people telling me that they didn't have to do anything that that end lady was telling them to do. And uh, there are a couple people who, don't, who didn't finish their career because of that. Um, Tell them the story about uh, the one patient who wanted you to meet the parents. Oh, yeah. 
had this patient who had had his arms broken and he could not write. So I would sit with him and talk with him and I would write letters back to his parents for him as he dictated it. And so he left and he was evacuated back to the United States and he would write occasionally while he was gone. And he said when I, he was living in California so when I came back that he would come and take me out to lunch. His parents drove him to Travis Air Force Base to take me out to lunch. And when their parents saw me, then they decided that they didn't eat lunch. <laughs> and so he was very hurt. And uh, I wrote to him a couple times after that. I don't know what happened. But one of the things that I did know is that the soldiers were, we had usually kind of given them a sense of comfort while they were in the hospitals. But we were also hearing that when they got back home, that their families did not make life as easy as we thought. They did, it, was not trans, uh, it was not a smooth transition when they came back. And after I lost him, uh, contact with him, I think that's probably what happened was that sometimes people do get pushed into the PTSD and stuff like that, how people respond to them when they came back home. One last question, right here, sir. In the blue there, I believe. Thank you. Uh, I just want to comment on a couple things. Uh, a thesis was written by a college student during the Vietnam War, and the title of his thesis was A Working Class War. And that's because primarily most of the people who died there and who fought there were blacks or poor whites. And when Martin Luther King and Muhammad Ali refused talked against the Vietnam War, they had a good reason for doing that. I think at the time, most of us didn't realize that. As a physician in Vietnam, I saw a lot of young, poor black boys who didn't know what the hell they were there for and had a really hard time. I think that was one of the tragedies of the draft system as it was set up at that time. I think, Timothy, you're the, the obvious person to have me direct this, this comment and this question to because, again, one of the things that you mentioned to me was that you yes. were as much opposed to the draft yes. as you were uh, to the war. And what was it about yes. the draft that you did not agree with? Well, pretty much just what the speaker there was, was saying. Um, it was heavily weighted against underprivileged people um, or, or the people who were not um, in a position to um, make use of the opportunities that, that um, others had. Um, the, um, as, as regards the question of why I never filed for a conscientious objector status, you know, it was just wildly unevenly um, uh, administered. There were some parts of the country where anybody who applied for it got it. There were other parts of the country where nobody ever got it. Uh, but as it was, unless you were a member of a pacifist church or some, some had some connection like that, you had to be able to uh, write you know, a, a virtual brief, almost like what something a lawyer would turn into a judge, to justify your position. And that depended on a lot of privilege. That depended on being able to go to school and get you know, um, um, uh, eloquent enough on, that's a, not, a, not a good word, but you know, coherent enough on paper to, to uh, convince people who probably weren't going to agree with you because they wouldn't be on, be on the draft board if they, if, if they uh, had. Uh, but you had to be able to convince those people, you know, for example, of, of uh, the, the uh, sincerity and a, a kind of logic, even if they couldn't accept it, that would induce them to give you a, a, um, a, uh, an exemption, uh, a CO uh, status. Um, that just you know, I, I saw myself as on the privilege side of that equation. You know, I didn't come from a, a big money background, certainly, but I had had opportunities that a lot of people didn't have. And, and I could have done that, you know, I was majoring in theology and all that. I was, I was not a ministerial student by any stretch. I was looking forward to an academic career. I was, thought I was going to be a college professor. Um, but that, you know, it, it, it was just, it was a kind of, of opportunity that other people didn't have. And uh, when somebody was not in school, possibly because they couldn't afford to go to school, possibly because they had come out of um, uh, substandard educational backgrounds that didn't allow them 
out, allow them to get into school. They were, you know, they were the ones that, that it was on the backs of and not solely, obviously there were, there were, um, other people, you know, involved in it, but as, as a matter of, uh, what sustained that whole misadventure, um, I thought it was, you know, even then I, I, it, it seemed to me, and, and, you know, King said that and Carmichael said that and, and a number of others that you know, it, it was just, uh, it was on the backs of, of, uh, people who were not going to benefit from it in any way and, and had no, no business being asked to, uh, to sustain it. Well, I think, first of all, I want to thank the audience. This has been a great audience. These have been superb questions that we've got. I can, I think you would all agree with me, the quality of the four panel members we got up here and the breadth of experience and the insights that they've been able to give us. So uh, before I turn over for a round of applause, just a, a couple more uh, comments here. Um, I'm glad to report that yes, it was only 19 months and 19 years that you were serving <laughs> over there. We want to get that straight. Uh, I would certainly encourage you all to, again, check out the, the full interviews. In some cases, they're quite long, but you know, we had two hours talking to Connie about her experiences growing up in Birmingham and participating in some of the more, most important events of the Civil Rights Movement at the time. And Patrick, your experience is, is such a different experience and it, it bodes us all well to have an understanding of the sacrifices that, that your family made to be able to come to the United States. So I want to have you all join me now in thanking our panel members. Mark. <laughs>